All right, thank you for coming to this week's postdoc talks. Today we have Dr. Emily Wickline, who will be talking about um, scientific image manipulation and ethical considerations related to that. So, please. Thank you, Karen. And thanks for the library system for giving me the opportunity to um, talk. It's a nice forum to practice, but I hope you guys get some good information out of um, this presentation. So, um, feel free to stop me at any time with questions. Um, and uh, you can raise your hand or just interject, because it, it, it will work better if I know what you guys um, are looking for uh, as well. So to begin with, um, image manipulation is really a growing problem. Um, this is uh, a graph showing the percent of open cases from the Office of Research Integrity, which is an office um, that um, oversees direct uh, public health services, such as the NIH, um, and it oversees those uh, activities on behalf of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, so they're really the ones that end up being the governing body of um, scientific ethics uh, for funding agencies. So here we see um, that right around um, the year 2000, uh, the percentage of cases uh, regarding image manipulation just skyrocketed. Um, and this is correlating with uh, the different types of um, image capturing that started occurring around that time. Um, and so um, this is something that's really come into light especially around 2000, and then it kind of peaked around 2007, but we're gonna continue to talk about it today. So what is image manipulation? Uh, the official definition, which is not um, necessarily a scientific one, is that it's the application of image editing techniques in order to create an illusion or deception in contrast to mere enhancement or correction uh, after the original imaging took place. Uh, you could also call it Photoshop. Um, now, image manipulation is considered research misconduct. Um, so, according to the NIH, research, research misconduct includes fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism um, in reporting research results. So, really, the image uh, manipulation falls under the falsification category. We're manipulating research materials, equipment, processes, changing or omitting data or results. Um, such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. Now, this can either be intentional or unintentional. So, really, I hope today to show you um, both sides of that, because um, we hope nobody's doing it intentionally, but there's also some things you might not be aware of that you're doing that could affect uh, your image results as well. So, why do scientists manipulate um, images? Uh, two main reasons are uh, to make their point more convincing. Uh, a lot of people say things like, well, I knew that was the result, but it wasn't quite clear in my data. And um, the scientific assumption of knowing what the results are, uh, despite what the data says, uh, I'm sure you all heard that, but it's actually not very ethical. Also, people uh, do manipulations for what they call presentation quality data, so the things that they want in the paper. Um, also, uh, so the next question is, uh, is this image manipulation always on purpose, or are there degrees of severity? Um, like I said before, not all image manipulations are on purpose, but all are considered research misconduct, so it's just something to be aware of. Why do we care? Um, really, as scientists, we want to protect the integrity of the scientific <coughs> research and the integrity of the scientific community. I'm sure we've all heard of those papers that have been um, redacted or changed, and um, we've all heard public outcry about that. And um, that really is um, just a bad mark on the scientific community, and it affects all of our papers. Even if you're not the one manipulating the images, it really gives um, bad connotation to, to the scientific way. Um, what is the result of image manipulation? And two things I want um, us to remember throughout the talk is 
that the first result is you're deceiving your colleagues. And again, this is this kind of goes with the protecting the integrity because not only do we want a good image outside of um, scientific community, but we want one inside. So um, you know, your career depends on it is a big thing. Um, but also, uh, you want to be able to trust what someone else is publishing. So um, if you put trustworthy stuff out there, that's the first step in in uh, creating just a really good environment for collaboration. Also, um, you may, and this is one of the unintentional aspects, you may deprive your colleagues of hidden results in your primary data. So the fact that we present our data and we think that this is the be all end all of this story is not always true. And there's sometimes, or a lot of times, other um, interpretations of that data. And though you didn't, um, Think of it at that time, it might spark somebody else's research interest and really help um, the field grow in general. So as I was talking before, a lot of the uh, uh, examples and research for this presentation is uh, from the um, article, What's in a Picture? The Temptation of Image Manipulation by Mike Rossner. Um, and this was published in 2004 when he was the managing editor Journal of Cell Biology, um, and at that time was really, um, if we went back to that um, graph of the percentage of, um, uh, or uh, cases with um, research misconduct, this was really around the peak of, of image manipulation problems. So um, it, it's a good paper because it gives really good examples, um, but it also sparked a really, um, a good movement in all of the journals and also the scientific community in going towards um, looking for this and not tolerating the image manipulation. So uh, I put in the end of my slides uh, like a reference page um, and go ahead and look that paper up. It's a really good one to read and most of the information there is still really relevant. Um, so first off, I just wanted to uh, go over a couple of the more popular journals to uh, their uh, instructions to authors to give you an example of, of how um, Rossner's paper has actually changed the direction in um, publishing papers. So when he wrote this paper, he has um, an entire section on journal guidelines and he says it's surprising how many journals say little or nothing about their, their instructions to authors about types of digital manipulations. And so that's really the only outdated part of this whole paper because since then, um, most journals actually do have now instructions for um, how not to manipulate their images. So the Nature Publishing Group is a pretty big um, uh, collection of journals and they say in their instruction to authors um, here, a certain degree of image processing is acceptable but for the final image it must correctly represent the original data and conform to community standards. Um, it also says the images submitted for the manuscript will, um, uh, for review should be minimally processed, and it gives examples. And then lastly, the author should retain all unprocessed data and metafiles because the editors will request them to aid in the manuscript evaluation. So this is a pretty new thing since 2004. Um, and it's just a reminder to you when you have your notebooks and your data, keep it um, organized, keep it neat, because a lot of these journals are now asking for the original files. Um, this is just the general guidelines that the Nature Publishing Group gives, but they also go into like specific details about what to include and what not to manipulate. And I'm going to go, I've incorporated that into my, um, into the later part of the lectures, but um, you can go to whatever journal you're looking at publishing in and, and look at what they specifically want. Um, also, here's just another example from the journal Cell Biology, which is where this Rossner paper was published. Um, they say all digital images in the manuscript accepted for publication will be scrutinized uh, by our production department for any indication of manipulation that is inconsistent with the following guidelines. And then it gives you a list of the guidelines. So they, they're pretty um, forward in saying that they're going to take your pictures and they're going to scrutinize them and they're going to make sure that you're not trying to deceive them. Um, also, manipulation that violates these guidelines may uh, result in production delays or revocation of acceptance. 
consequence. So a lot of these journals also give consequences of, of the manipulation, just to be clear. Um, from these two journals, and also just from all the journals I looked at, there ends up being three general guidelines which we want to follow for um, image manipulation, and then I'll go into specific examples for like Western blots and, and um, uh, like microscopy. But um, when we think about image manipulation, we want to remember these three points. Um, no specific feature within an image may be enhanced, obscured, moved, removed, or introduced. So this appears to be pretty logical, but there are some things that you might do that um, actually uh, fall under this category that are unintentional. Um, the grouping of images from different parts of the same gel, different gels, fields, exposures, etc., must be made explicit by the arrangement of the figures in the text or, and or in the figure legend. So we'll go over that as well. And then lastly, the adjustments of brightness, contrast, color balance are acceptable if they're applied to every pixel in the picture, um, as long as they do not um, obscure or do anything mentioned in uh, the first part. And this, uh, an important part of this, it also includes the background of the image. So are there any questions so far? This is just kind of the general image manipulation. Um, and then I'm going to go into these three specifics because they're usually what most of the manipulation occurs, where most of the manipulation occurs. So if you have questions, again, ask. But now we'll go into these um, three areas. So the first one is kind of applies to both um, Western blots, gels, and microscopy, um, and it is resolution. So to talk about resolution, we have to first define what a pixel is. So does everybody understand what a pixel is? It's just a, a uniform color within an image. It's just a, a, a dot, right? It makes up the entire image. Um, oops. And so resolution in general is, um, is the number of pixels per unit area. So we also often call it DPI, dots per inch. Um, and for example, if you had uh, 300 pixels by 300 pixels, that would be 300 DPI, but that's actually 90,000 total pixels. So this is just how our, our um, meta files are, are made up on the computer. So um, with respect to uh, image manipulation, the one thing you want to remember is you should never set the total number of pixels to be greater than that of the original image. So let's say you go into Photoshop. You want to do something like add, I don't know, just words, a description, an error, or anything. And you go in at um, 300 DPI. You'd never want to save that new file then as 600 DPI. Because what you end up doing is you're creating data that was not present in the original image. So this um, falls under the no specific feature within an image may be enhanced, obscured, removed, or introduced. Does this make sense? Any questions on that? It really, you know, you don't do it on purpose, but um, what you end up doing is making your one, you know, yellow square you divide it into multiple yellow shades. And if you were to then take that image and um, do some kind of quantitation on it, you'd actually have added data that wasn't there. Um, so also to remember with this is to always take your original file for any kind of quantitative analysis because you want to just start from the basics. So that's just a, uh, the first note on resolution, which applies to all different um, types of data. So then um, the next thing a lot of these journals go into is electrophoretic gels and blots. So these are things like DNA, RNA gels, Western blots, SDS page gels, anything that's going to have the band on it um, or multiple bands. So the uh, Nature Publishing Group and Journal Cell Biology and other journals First off, they list things that um, they want you to include on each gel and block. And I put them here just so you make had a general reference next time you're making a, a public, you know, a publication quality image. So you want to make sure you have positive and negative controls on each block. 
and molecular size markers. Uh, when you do cropping, you only crop if it improves the clarity and concisiveness of the presentation. So this is something we'll go into a little bit later, but cropping becomes one of those unintentional removal of data um, points that um, you might be doing, but it's also considered image manipulation. Uh, for cropping, you must retain important bands. And for like, this was from the Nature Publishing Group, it says you need to retain six bandwidths above and below a band when you are showing For quantitation, uh, they don't want comparisons between two different plots. They always want things to run on the same plot. So there's, the people who have done a lot of wet science understand that every time you cast a gel or buy a gel or buy a membrane, there's subtle differences. You know, maybe you're gonna run one gel at a different voltage or um, transfer it or stain it for a different time. And then when you're trying to do quantitations between those two plots, it's not actually happening. So a lot of these journals are considering that as a, uh, a point, or is a point you want to consider because um, it's one of those borderline manipulation points that you might be doing um, on accident. And then for exposures, you do not want to use high contrast gels and blots. You always want to strive for gray backgrounds. Um, and most of the people who like expose gels and blots understand what this means. Um, it's basically you don't want to blow out the exposure um, and miss some bands. Um, also, a lot of journals are now um, including multiple exposures and like supplementary data. So depending on how you capture your image, you probably want to just take as many exposures as possible. I'm sure your boss isn't going to like all the <laughs> films or whatever you have, but um, it's better in the long run to cover your bases as the primary researcher on that. Topic than, um, to go back and not have what you need. So let's go into some um, specific examples that were found in this Rossner paper um, about uh, misrepresentation of data. And um, the author did say that all of these were um, taken from, well, the images aren't from original cases, but the um, thought behind them is. So these were things I actually encountered as, as an editor of Journal Cell Biology. Um, and so they brought them to your attention in this paper. So first, um, they have a, a subcategory of gross misrepresentation. So this is something we hope nobody is doing because this is what they would consider more intentional. Um, and the first one is deleting a band. So in this uh, figure from the paper, um, you can see that up here in panel A, the original image had a band here, but they deleted it here. And like I said, I hope this is, is obvious, but this is not um, ethical. Because whatever you're loading in lane three, um, you just totally taken it out and said, I don't think it exists anymore, basically, but it still does. Um, and then the same goes for adding a band to a plot. So, if you thought, oh, I know, I knew that, you know, this was an IP or whatever it is, and it should have had such and such bands, and you add a, a band here, that's also not good. So, again, um, when we look back at the general guidelines, this is a pretty obvious one, that um, no specific feature should be removed or introduced into your name. So what's to stop a researcher from submitting the already manipulated image as the original image? I mean, it, it, so that's when the journals, I think, are really going back to, to trying to find the, the most raw piece of data. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go over at the end. There's ways to like figure this stuff out. Okay. Um, and the uh, Office of Research Integrity, ORI, has tools on their website that you can put your images in and see what they think if you really want to, hopefully you don't want to see what they think because I hope nobody does it on purpose, but um, I don't think there's anything to stop them from doing it, but I think that there's more ways than um, the researchers know of how they're figuring this out. Okay. Um, yeah, so the image manipulation is considered post-imaging. So 
they all, all, all these manipulations in Photoshop or whatever, they leave like footprints and you would most likely be able to see like where around this band uh, it was different. So, does that answer your question? So, um, I just wanted to give uh, an example from a paper I published recently um, about regarding the deleting bands for a while. So, I didn't do it, but <laughs> no, I just want to show how uh, this is a, a figure from one of my papers. And because I didn't want to do this, the, the unintentional deletions of lots, I just included everything. And this is something maybe we're doing unintentionally and saying, oh, um, it's this band or it's this band. When you run a gel and the antibody's crappy or whatever, and you really don't know, um, it's better, all these journals say, to uh, for full disclosure. It would be better to put something like this in your blot than put this band or whatever and miss the data. This also goes back to that point earlier we made about deceiving your colleagues and having information in your primary data. So I don't know what this means. I really don't. But maybe someone's going to look at my paper and say, oh, that's awesome. This means, you know, this piece of data is different from this piece of data, and they can use that and, and build on that. Um, so uh, we ran into no problems with the editors about submitting these kinds of lots because the, the uh, like I said, the antibodies aren't that great for them, and also the research on these proteins isn't extensive enough to know which size it really is. Um, so I would just encourage you to always err on the side of caution and if you don't know what it is just put it all in there and this ended up in a primary figure it wasn't like supplementary so um, the editors are, are pretty good with that okay so the last point under gross misrepresentation of um, blots is maybe something that I think actually people might do um, unintentionally as well and it's duplicating bands so Let's say you were running a, a blot and you know that they were all equally loaded and then you're going to put this in a figure and you can't find your original um, loading control. So you basically take what you did in this experiment and you duplicate it here. I mean, it's pretty obvious it's the exact same one. Um, and some people don't think this is a wrong, but it, it actually is considered um, misconduct and image manipulation. Especially, especially if you don't say something about it to figure. Um, again, there might be ways to get around it. Um, not get around it, but um, again, do full disclosure. Um, if you didn't want to put like a, a loading control on everyone, some will say, you know, we, your figure loader might say you're included a representative figure for this, but um, you never want to like use do quantitation with a loading control from a different blot, especially one that's duplicated. And maybe we've seen this, this is one I'm sure I've seen in papers. Um, and I, I don't think it's as, as intentional maybe as, as um, the paper, that this Rossner paper indicated. So um, again, how do we, how can we avoid this one, this manipulation specifically is rerun the same. Like when in doubt, rerun the samples. So again, this this goes into the second one of those general guidelines, where the grouping of images from different parts or this uh, the same gel or from different gels um, must be made explicit, and it's not here. Uh, so then we're going to go into subtle manipulations, uh, a subtopic under these electrophoretic gels and blots, um, and something that I'm sure we've all looked at is brightness and contrast adjustments. Um, especially if you're doing something like like the LIHCOR imaging, where you're actually not using the um, uh, photographic or the, um, the films, but you're using the computer to do it, and then taking that image and going to Photoshop to more or less expose your, your image. Um, you really could run into brightness and contrast um, over and under adjustments in those scenarios. Um, this is an example from the Rossner paper 
um, which I think is more intentional than unintentional, but um, where they take a certain, uh, this is a, a, like a fractionation of, of proteins, and usually you get a peak, right? So there's the peak protein here, and it should taper off, and it didn't in the original image. So then again, the authors took it under their um, thought that it would be okay uh, to adjust the single band brightness and contrast. So this isn't something, even though it may not be, well, it's primary data, but it may not be the most important piece of data in your, your presentation or in your work. It's still not something you want to do. It's not ethical. Um, again, this is the this has to do with the adjustments of brightness and contrast, and the fact that you're not applying it to every pixel in that image is correct. So, um, here's another example, which is one that maybe we've done it at times. It's the over adjusting of brightness and contrast. So here's the original image, and here's a, a more um, a different adjustment of brightness and contrast. And they go all the way to the, the point where the only band that is showing up is this last one. And this isn't right either. It goes under all of those adding and deleting band um, points that we went over before. You're, you're depriving your colleagues of these bands, but you're also you're misrepresenting the data, frankly. Um, and then, um, so for this point, a lot of journals, this is why they say you know they want to see a gray background. They don't want to see you blow out the, the contrast in those images because it most likely is not um, an accurate representation. And something like this, would you guys consider this to even be manipulated? There's some bands here that aren't showing up. So even though you might say, ah, I still keep the important ones. Who's to judge what's important? <laughs> it will be the journal, but it, it really is a point where you've crossed that line of manipulating the image. Okay, so again, this goes under the adjustments uh, a guideline uh, where you don't want to misrepresent any of the information presented in the original, including background. So another subtle manipulation is cleaning up background. And um, this could be a misuse of certain Photoshop tools, such as the rubber stamp or clone tool. You don't want to use those when you submit an image. So it may not be very obvious in here, but from the original image, the authors removed slight bands. Now this, this is crud. It's not a band, but they still removed it. It's still not a band. A good thing to do. Um, this band they think is is not useful, and they removed it, and these two as well. So, um, the the cloning and rubber stamp tool are actually really easy for um, editors to detect if you've done. All they have to do basically is like put the contrast and brightness way to the extremes, and you'll see that it's not like a um, very uniform distribution. Um, so, it's just not worth it. Um, if you have questions on the data, you should always just rerun it. So this would be considered obscuring and removing um, data from, from uh, your blots. Now lastly, for the electrophoretic gels and blots is something else that um, we may not be aware of is splicing lanes together. This is becoming a, a pretty big deal. Um, what the um, editors of the journals want you to do is to be very transparent when it comes to having um, blots uh, side by side. Um, so you, what you want to do is leave a thin line between juxtaposed bands if they're not from the same blot, which they should be, or if they're not from the same side by side line. Um, the ways to avoid this is if you still have a sample, just run it in the right order and you won't run into questions about whether you're manipulating the data. Um, and um, you can always note things in the figure legend as well. 
um, if, if you think you might run into questions. Uh, this was a little more than just juxtaposed bands. They actually, um, in the original uh, offense, because this was from the um, Office of Research Integrity website, they actually shifted the bands as well. So these were, these were all one size, but they took it upon themselves to move in. A lot of this happens, there are those assays where you want a band shift. And um, uh, in those ones, you probably just want to put them on the same block next to each other and present that, because there's no question about that. But this is, this is a pretty big offense. And um, I have it in the tools at the end, but this website, um, the Office of Research Integrity, is really cool because, like I said, it gives you tools to look at your own data to make sure it's not being manipulated. But it also has like, um, I don't want to say games, but it has example, more examples um, if you have questions about um, subtle manipulations and things like this. So again, we don't want to group the images from different parts of the gel or the same gel um, in a way that's not made explicit. Okay, so the second part, or the third part, is actually looking at microscopy. So this is another big area of offense uh, for publishing data. And as I did with the blots, I'll just um, list for you the things that a lot of the journals want you to include, including scale bars, um, the make and model of the microscope, temperature, imaging medium, uh, fluorochromes. Think all these things will actually affect your data. Um, so they, they want them listed, and any software used for processing the data. Um, and the big thing with microscopy is adjustments, if they're made, should be applied to the entire image. And that's pretty much the be all and all of microscopy. And if you're not doing that, um, it is also easy to detect. So here's uh, the first example that the Rossner paper gives. Uh, about enhancing specific features of a uh, <coughs> microscope image, so they consider it pseudocoloring. So here's the original image, and this is both particle labeling, and here's the manipulated image. So they know that these these are the image gold. Um, these are the gold particles, but in the image, it actually didn't show up very well. So they went ahead and they used the fill bucket tool, and they they made their dots darker. And this, this is not appropriate. Um, again, this is adjusting color balance. It's not applied to every pixel. So you, you can't do it. So how can this be avoided? Uh, there's a couple ways. You can do things like adding arrows. Remember in the beginning they said add arrows? That's appropriate. So if you want to highlight something that's not highlighted, add the arrows. Also, you could re-image. Um, I've done a lot of TEM, and just because this is here means these get um, this gets exposed properly and these don't. So if you if you have um, something that this happens, there might be a reason why. So just go back to the original image and see if you can get a better picture. Um, so the next uh, part of my cross I want to go over is linear versus nonlinear adjustments. So. Um, this one's a little more complicated, and um, I've given a second reference besides the Rockstone paper for avoiding twisted pixels by Douglas Cromney from 2010, and this goes into a lot of the mathematical um, manipulations in mi microscope image, uh, like microscopy and stuff. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview, but if you want more details, go to this because um, the Photoshop and, and those kinds of programs have a lot of details in what each um, what each line or a command does. Uh, so if you don't know, you probably don't want to um, use that adjustment command or whatever for your image. But um, one of the most uh, common mistakes is using um, a nonlinear adjustment for your images. So um, again, a linear adjustment, which is applied to every pixel, is okay. And these are things in Photoshop like brightness and contrast. But nonlinear um, uh, manipulations are not okay. So this is what you would call um, a gamma output, which is a technique that adjusts midtone levels. Um, you can 
in Photoshop, this is adjusting curves and adjusting levels. So um, an example of this, this is just a graph to show um, when you use different um, values for gamma, how uh, the tones within the image are represented. And again, this gets into a lot of math, and, and please pick up the uh, Twisted Pixels paper if you want to go into it. But basically, if you have a gamma of 1, it's more or less a linear um, change in the intensities. But as you do uh, different values, you see how it curves, and it, it actually enhances the middle part um, and not the ends. So this is not considered um, adjusting uh, pixels evenly. So it's something to be aware of. Um, and lastly, uh, in microscopy, um, one of the manipulations people run into is misrepresentation of a microscopic field. Now this can be something that doesn't involve imaging, um, such as saying, <laughs> You know, you have like 20 cells that all had the same thing and they didn't. Um, or having, you know, a, a slide and saying you have representative fields and you actually only get them in one area. So those would be not related to the image but also considered misrepresentation of a field. Uh, this is a more um, intentional misrepresentation of the field where the, the author actually took cells from different um, uh, pictures and put them all onto one image, slide, whatever you want to call it, um, and just to consolidate the data. But this, this isn't something uh, that's considered appropriate either. And this brings up a good point. Um, so the authors of the Rossner Yamada paper actually showed how this was detected. And I, I've, um, I hinted at it before, but basically what they did is did a, a contrast adjustment and you can tell that the field isn't even um, underneath these cells. So it's really easy to detect. Is that, you see how that is? This should all be just one uniform adjustment and it's not. So this brings up uh, the last topic I want to go over um, is how are editors detecting manipulation. So uh, they're checking the images of accepted manuscripts now, which they used to only do like uh, sampling of, but they're doing it for all manuscripts. And this is usually done by the editors um, and the offices of, of these different um, manuscripts. Uh, and when you're submitting a final uh, figure, um, the authors may be asked to submit original figures as well in unprocessed images. And any problems that they encounter will result in either production delays or um, your paper won't get published at all. So uh, an, another thing I, I told you about is this Office of Research Integrity has a number of forensic tools to deauthenticate images. And these are actually uh, using tools within Photoshop to detect manipulation of Photoshopping. So um, if you go to the website listed at the end, you can get a lot of details on how to detect this um, if you're interested in that as well. So lastly, when in doubt, rerun the experiment for real presentation quality data. That's just a, a good representation, um, an accurate representation of your data. Um, do it on the same gel. Use the same exposure for either that gel or those two images, etc. And always use full disclosure when in doubt. So, any questions? <clears throat> Could you actually go to the ORI website or show? Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, in the handouts I gave you, there's um, references. So these are the papers I use, and these are some tools. So. <laughs> Uh, this one is the RI Forensics. Um, so this is um, 
their principles to remember, and these are all like their games or not games, but their <laughs> examples of manipulation. But if you go to, I think it's just uh, um, forensic tools here. Um, it talks about these different, so the forensic droplets and forensic actions. Um, and I'm not like a super huge Photoshop person. I was going to go into details on these, but um, I've not used them. So the droplet is basically um, some something where you can drag the image in and it will do the um, checking for manipulation for you, where this advanced forensics is um, it's just a different program used within Photoshop. So I'm not sure if they, um, if you, uh, I think you can download them from this website as well. Have you ever, you or a colleague ever put your stuff into the website just for fun and it comes back that they think it's manipulated? I haven't yet. Okay. I am, um, but that would be interesting, you know, to do. I'm one of those people, I'm a little scared to put it on the <laughs> website if you do it on purpose. I was like having trouble just researching this stuff. I didn't want him to think, you know, I was doing it. But um, no, I haven't actually done that. Um, I'm sure it's a good tool if you want to just try it out. But um, yes. Do you know if anyone as journal editors have gone back in the past before these tools were available? Yes, they have. And spot checked, like older yeah. papers of someone who's guilty. Yeah. Um, now. Yeah, but I don't think they like can do anything about it. Um, but I know track? that there's. Uh, I did see some data out there about. Um, so this other. Um, I think this, fifty percent will be retracted. This article <laughs> right here from um, the Nature News, uh, Science Journal's crackdown on image manipulation said they retroactively looked at it, and I think it was about twenty five percent had image manipulations and again most of these people said well I knew that that band wasn't and, and they said it didn't like um, it's a hard have, line to draw between yeah. what, what's wrong image manipulation and what's well most of them were like more of that gross manipulation oh, really? <laughs> yeah and um, they were saying like but it didn't end up changing the overall um, conclusions of that paper but again this comes that becomes that ethical line like who draws the line into deceiving your colleagues, right? So those one bands you added or deleted could really help your colleagues' paper. Um, it could help their research direction, and um, that's something you just don't want to get caught up in. Um, but yeah, they said about 25% Amazing. had that. I mean, I, I'm sure there was a time between when they were detecting it and when it they like cracked down on it where it probably was a really rampant problem some people thought, well, I can get away with it. Um, so maybe it's blown out of proportion, but it's a large amount. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we used to not manipulate, but now according to this guideline, maybe manipulation. But just to make a story easier to yeah. uh, comprehend, maybe we have to take some lean out, which is not acceptable. But is it a common practice that you know people can submit the original data? as a uh, supplementary document and then maybe non-intentionally but some kind of manipulation just to make the story just highlight something. yeah I'm sure if you like load a gel and you had like a positive or yeah. negative control or something, something. that's I, I'm sure do. that's different you know or like a lot of times I run like 50 no, or like 25 well gel uh, well gels and I'll do like one set of experiments, two, and that. And you don't want to rerun it just for yeah. because you put I mean, one jail wrong or yeah, something. Yeah, it's one thing to um, cut the bands off like yeah. in those lanes, but if you're if you have more you than one the experiment on there, it really that that doesn't appear to fall into that manipulation category. I know it's one of those lines, yeah, but you cannot um, take it out. But if it's completely irrelevant, it is yeah, relevant. And, I mean that becomes on one of those points where you know. Um, you put those the black lines or white lines between the gels. That is probably because they did have those samples that were irrelevant once they ran them, and they just wanted to make the data more concise. I'm sure again that kind of walks one of those lines, but that's maybe more um, black and white than. I mean, in the old days, 
before this manipulation, people take the picture. So they do the Western blot and then put it on top. I mean, when I started, we did it in that way, you know, put it, put all the, uh, I mean, I mean immunoblot mm -hmm. on top of the table and then the photographer comes take the picture. So yeah. And there was no, there's there is no, no uh, manipulation you can yeah. do. I mean, or you can do it in a very crude way. At the very beginning, you can change this, and then <laughs> people yeah. can take the picture. But it's a, uh, it's interesting uh, how um, I now use a light core imaging system, and how easy, easy, easy it is very to do all this stuff because you know you you get it as a TIFF that's like totally black, and you have to adjust it, but you have to be careful you're not over adjusting it, and. Um, uh, it's really nice because you don't have to like have a hundred exposures, but um, it's also really walking a fine line sometimes of, of what you think's right and, and what is actually there. Because journal, you know, they cannot post all those as a supplementary material yeah. because these are huge files. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure if they had a problem with it, they probably wouldn't accept the paper in general, you know, but. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you. <laughs> it's really helpful.